But as we come in time of the sermon, I thank you, Lord, that you've given our words to our sister Farah this morning. Mm-hmm. May you just be with her and guide her and be beside her as she shares your word, Father, that you've given her. May we be excited about the word. May we just want to just feel the presence of Jesus, even more, the Holy Spirit from the Bible, Lord, and just share this with her. Thank you, Lord, for your beginning. May we be absorbent in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. So glad to have you here. And yeah. Probably can I see you all? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay, for leading us so wonderfully this morning. And for prayers and sharing we have had. How just significant what you shared, especially Nigel, that you've been going through some challenges. Because this morning I thought we'd talk about the fruits of the Spirit. There are so many, nine of them. So you better press yourself onto your chairs. <laughs> I'm joking. We're only going to look at joy. So I pray and hope that as I share the word, uh, the Lord's word, that you find some answers, some resemblance, mm-hmm. something to hold on to by the time you live today, as we talk about joy. I do want to give you scriptures on the uh, a machine there, but you've got pieces of paper. So I'll ask for a volunteer to read for me Galatians chapter four. Five, this is 22 to 23, please. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Thank you, Hilary. Amen. So, joy, I'm going to focus on joy today. I I should have put this on the screen to say joy, the J stands for Jesus first. The O stands for others second. And the third is why, is you or I, is the third. Often when we think of joy, we think of an emotion. We think that joy is a response to something good that has happened. Happiness or the result of a favorable set of circumstances. We think that joy cannot be controlled. We assume that when things go right in our lives, when God has answered our prayers, and we are celebrating our Mm -hmm. victories, joy will come automatically. We also think that during hardship or waiting for God, it is impossible to be joyful during that season. The enemy has convinced us that joy is completely out of our control and depend on our circumstances. But joy is not happiness. What separates joy from happiness? Happiness is circumstantial. What happened, for example, we had the four days bank holiday. Did we not have a good time, good rest, especially from work? But after those four days, it ended, isn't it? We went back to work, to school, to our day-to-day chores. Which means happiness is an emotion. It is temporary, fleeting, and external. What then is joy? Rick Warren writes that joy goes deeper. It is an inside job, an attitude, a choice to rejoice. I will talk about joy and rejoicing because joy is the noun and rejoice is the act of being joy. Joy starts as a seed, a seed of faith that matures and grows through obedience to God's word. 
given enough time and attention, this small shoot of well-watered faith will grow into something so unshakable that even life's most torrential downpours can't wash it away. Paul in Galatians 5 tells us that joy is the fruit of the Spirit. So if it is a fruit, which means it cannot be manufactured, but can only be cultivated, growing joy may not be the same as tending a garden, but there are resemblances. The parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. Uh, I know if I say someone, it will take long. Sonia, may you please read for me, Matthew 13, verses 1 to 9. Thank you. The same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. All the seed <coughs> fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Since the other seed fell on good soil, where it produces a crop, a hundred, sixty, or thirty times what we sow, whoever has ears, let him hear. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Jesus then talks about four types of soil, three kinds that will stand our spiritual growth, and one that will foster it. The first three are characterized by hard, Packed debt, hard heartedness. Shallow soil is lack of perseverance, and thorns are worries and distractions. If we allow ourselves to personify any of these examples, we will find joy hard to come by. But the fourth type of soil, the good soil, promises to yield a rich harvest of fruit in our lives. Mm -hmm. How do we avoid the pitfalls mentioned in this parable? We keep a soft heart by being open to the things of God. Don't just take God's word at face value, but dig deep. Dig deep into it so that when trials come your way, your faith won't be easily uprooted. And be sure to pay close attention to the word. And don't allow the tone of this world to draw your heart and mind away from it. And above all, hear God's word with an ear toward understanding it and responding. In the end, our response to his word is what makes all the difference. I have an example of joy in action. Nowhere else do we see such a clear picture of this than in the life of Jesus. The one who could have settled for happiness personal happiness, he chose joy instead. Even if it meant going to the cross, how could Jesus willingly choose to endure such an imaginable pain and suffering? He did it for his Father's glory. He did it for our salvation. But according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Bethany, may you please read for me Hebrews 12, verse 2. Thank you. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen. He also did it for the joy that was set before him. He knew that beyond the cross, the right hand of his father's throne awaited him. He believed in something good, and this faith made him enjoy the pain. Although he was God, he was also man. 
and this faith sustained him through the trials he faced and allowed him to see the joy beyond the pain. You and I are no different. Without faith and the joy it brings, we wither and shrivel. What then when there's no joy? Because we know sometimes, yes, you've got your garden, yes, you're tender and you're watering. You look at the apple tree, but the fruits are not coming. But you're doing the right thing. Even though joy is a fruit of the spirit, at times the tree can seem a little bare. Where do we find joy when it seems there's no joy to be had? These are the times when the difference between joy and happiness come clear. Consider the irony of James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Maria, are you able to read for me, James? Thank you. Consider it pure joy, my brother and sisters, whenever you face trial of many kinds, because you know that the testing of the faith produces perseverance. Let pers perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Thank you. Yeah, consider that irony, what James is saying. James tells us that we should think of trials as joy, really. What you're going through, Nigel, what I shared on Friday was something happening at work, really? Is that joy? Are these the words of someone who has lost touch with reality? Someone who has a confused sense of what joy really is all about? But no. As someone who gave his life to the gospel, James knows a thing or two about trials. And yet he encourages us, his readers, to regard them as joy. Why? What is the connection? According to James, trials bring joy because they test our faith. What is joyful about that, you ask? Isn't there a more pleasant way to find joy? In James' mind, it's not the testing that's joyful. It's the steadfastness that results. When you are suffering, you are drawn close to God. When you are having a challenging time, we pray and hope that your first call is on your knees to God at the foot of the cross. So, so far, we have learned that joy is not a feeling based on circumstances but it's something more permanent that goes beyond temporary satisfaction or happiness. We've looked at how to cultivate it by planting seeds of faith and nurturing them through obedience by God's word. We have seen how the soil of our hearts is primary indicator of how well joy will grow in our lives. And we've discovered that trials, rather than stealing our joy, can increase the joy. We will not have done any justice to joy if we haven't considered what Paul says about joy. In this letter to the Philippi church, Paul told them to rejoice. This is rejoicing, this joy expressed. May I ask, Roy, may I please read Philippians 4, verse 4 for me, please? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Mm. He, thank you, Roy. He told them to rejoice in the Lord. And not only that, he commanded them to rejoice mm. in the Lord always. Mm. To rejoice in the Lord is to rejoice in the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm. Because he is unchanging. Our joy can be unchanging too. How important is this call to rejoice? So important that Paul says it again in the same place. A command so critical that he doesn't mind repeating it. Perhaps he's repeating it himself 
not only because it's an important concept, but also because he knows that we are prone to forget. As believers, we will walk through plenty of things in life that will steal our happiness, but can never, can never walk through anything that can steal our joy if we choose to rejoice. The key word there is choose. Rejoicing is the willful, purposeful act of calling out the joy that we already have and making it central in our minds and hearts. Rejoicing reminds us the reality that exists beyond our circumstances and it changes our perspective on those circumstances. It reminds us that whatever we may pass through in this life is central to the ultimate truth of our redemption and salvation through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that, that is where the real joy begins and ends. If we have not put our faith and trust in Christ, joy will be elusive because we won't have this unwavering truth to fall back on. But if we are in Christ, then we can agree with Paul that the afflictions we face in this life are far outweighed by the eternal glory we share in Christ. Glory beyond all comparison. Today and always, rejoice in the things that are unseen rather than seen. Rejoice in the promises of our God rather than the pleasures of the world. Be convinced of who you are and who you are in Christ. Be sure to measure your sin and faith daily through the water of God's word. No matter what your current circumstances may be, don't be consumed by them. Instead, choose to remember that you are deeply loved, fully known, and completely forgiven in Christ. Choose to believe that no hardships that you endure in this life will ever separate you from the, God, from the grace of God in Christ. Choose to rejoice. Even when you won't feel like rejoicing, in other words, your word for you today is joy. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, Help us to rejoice always in you, for this is the key to finding real, lasting joy. Mm -hmm. If we rejoice only in our circumstances, mm -hmm. we are only rejoicing in our own pleasure. Help us instead to find joy in you, yes. the unchanging one, yes. where our hope <coughs> and joy will always be secure. Yes. Thank you for your love and faithfulness yes. toward us. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that you found that sermon helpful and would like to join us again on another Sunday. In the meantime, you'll find resources available at our website, on YouTube. So please do take the opportunity to have a look, but let's hope to see you soon. God bless you.